Hypochondria is a condition, a very real, often very serious condition, that causes those afflicted to believe they have one or many other medical conditions. The use of the word has changed over the years in the same way that terms like OCD have changed with casual use. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is an actual disorder that can have very serious lifestyle and medical consequences. But we often use it as a hyperbolic statement about someone's orderliness or meticulousness or preference for habit and routine. Likewise, we might playfully call someone a hypochondriac for sometimes worrying that they might be getting sick or wondering if maybe they'll catch that new plague a la mode that's been on the news all week. But that labeling, that particular use of the word, is a far cry from what hypochondria actually entails. In most modern medical scenarios, doctors are actually more likely to use the term somatic symptom disorder when discussing a true serious case of hypochondria. SSD refers to cases where patients are experiencing symptoms that don't show up on any medical examination or test and which cannot be explained by an existing mental disorder or a substance in their system. That means panic caused by a panic disorder does not fall under this category, nor does paranoia caused by smoking weed or an ache or pain that's explained away by an x-ray. Somatic system disorders cause those who suffer from them to not only feel a symptom that doesn't seem to actually be there, as far as modern medicine can tell anyway, it also makes them feel absolutely convinced that what they are experiencing is an indication of some specific or non-specific disease. The patient will also be concerned about that thing they believe they have far out of proportion to what they would actually feel if they truly had it under normal circumstances. So it's not just having a stomach ache that doesn't have an obvious explanation. It's having a stomach ache without an obvious explanation that you also worry might be cancer. And that worry, that specific concern, keeps you up all night every night, even though you have no reason to believe that that's what it is, beyond sheer, internal, nonsensical panic. Importantly, this condition is different from what's often called malingering, which involves making up symptoms to commit some kind of fraud, to skip school to get attention, to get drugs, something along those lines. Folks who experience hypochondria experience these symptoms and these outsized worries in a very honest, very real feeling way. Just as someone who suffers from chronic depression can't just snap out of it because it doesn't make rational sense to feel down based on how their life has been progressing, someone who is suffering from hypochondria cannot just snap out of their worry spiral just because all evidence says that they're okay. That's not how it works. Like anything involving people, and especially people's brains and bodies, though, hypochondria exists on a spectrum. For patients to be officially diagnosed with the condition, they have to experience these symptoms, including that outsized concern, for at least six months. And a lot of people who experience these types of things will do so for a period of time, and then something will change, either outside of them or inside of them, and it will go away, which makes it, by the official definition at least, a different thing. There are also degrees of worry, degrees of certitude about one's symptoms, and about everything else involved with this condition. There are also variations in how hypochondria predominantly manifests in a person. One of the better known subtypes of this condition is body dysmorphic disorder, which is defined as someone feeling with absolute certitude that something is wrong with some part of their body, and an outsized concern about that perceived imperfection which can lead to some seriously harmful consequences. And there's another that's tellingly called pain disorder, in which the afflicted party experiences pain that doesn't seem to have any reason to be there, and that pain is made even worse by their constant and persistent worrying about it and what it might mean. It's interesting, I think, that all of these disorders are so easily reduced to what we might call lesser versions of the same. We can call someone a hypochondriac not because they suffer from actual somatic symptom disorder, but because of something else. 
Maybe they've been exposed to years of media-sparked concerns about the newest swine flu that's happening somewhere halfway around the world. And that, in turn, has led to a kind of psychological stress, something that's perhaps not hypochondria in the official diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders sense, but in another sense, a type of illness, if we want to call it that, which has an entirely different source, but a similar outcome if one that is still not anywhere near as potent as the full-on DSM-approved version in most cases. What I'd like to talk about today is something that is happening in the medical world that some experts worry could lead to a flooding of doctor's offices and emergency rooms, and potentially even a technology-catalyzed wave of hypochondria-like symptoms around the world. On the other hand, this shift could also help people become more aware of themselves, their bodies, and their overall day-to-day -day well-being. Today we'll be discussing consumer-grade medical devices. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also contribute monetarily at letsknowthings.com using PayPal or Venmo and things like that. Or you can contribute non-monetarily by leaving a quick review for the show up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, or sharing it with a friend who you think might enjoy it, or with your social network of choice. All of these efforts, no matter what shape they take, are very much appreciated. Thank you very much to everyone who has already contributed in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. In the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, regulates medical devices. More specifically, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDHR, a branch of the FDA, provides market approval for all new medical devices that companies want to sell within the country. This regulatory body also keeps tabs on the safety hazards, performance accuracy, and manufacturing standards and processes that surround and define the medical device market. Most countries around the world have a similar regulatory body that operates within their borders, and the specifics of each one varies, but because the U.S. is such a large consumer market, and because of how arguably messed up our healthcare system is, and it's often messed up in favor of healthcare device companies rather than patients, doing business here is particularly lucrative. So a lot of companies, even if they are not from here or don't do all of their business in the United States, will prioritize our standards over anyone else's. And as United States regulatory standards go, all medical devices made available in the country fit into one of three classes. Class 1 devices are things like Q-tips and toothbrushes. These are objects that are inarguably useful and sometimes even complex or expensive to manufacture, but which are also unlikely to cause horrible bodily injury should they malfunction in some way. Class 2 devices typically require a good deal of regulatory exploration before they go to market, and they can cause harm if they malfunction or if they don't operate as intended. Powered wheelchairs and some types of pregnancy test kit are considered to be class 2 devices. Class 3 devices are new products that could cause serious harm if something goes wrong, and which we don't know much about because they're so novel. Think pacemakers and artificial hearts. These are serious pieces of technology that often have a life hanging on the line if they malfunction. All classes of medical devices are subject to what's called general controls, which means that they're put through the system to keep tabs on possible adulteration or misbranding, the faking of materials that are contained within the product, or the faking of the product itself, a pirated version of a particular device, for instance. They're also checked for banned substances and devices. They are inspected to see if they meet repair and replacement standards. They are filtered based on whether they live up to regional standards for good manufacturing practices, things like that. Class 2 and 3 devices are subject to additional special controls alongside those general controls. 
These special controls include testing to ensure that they meet performance standards, to ensure they have proper required labeling in place, and to ensure they adhere to post-market surveillance requirements, which basically means there have to be guarantees in place that allow the FDA and CDHR to know with a degree of certitude that nothing has been tampered with or swapped out within the product after it was produced and shipped. This is especially important for things like drugs, but also things like implants or HIV diagnostic tests, or swapping out expensive parts for less expensive parts at some point between the warehouse and the storefront, could potentially lead to death or injury. Class 3 devices, with few exceptions, must adhere to all of those other regulatory oversights, but also require pre-market approval, meaning they have to provide tons of additional information about the device, how it's made and manufactured, a bunch of studies showing that it does what it says it does, and others that indicate that it is safe for its intended use. The clinical trials and the at times vastly increased timeline before you can release a product that falls into this category makes class 3 medical devices a lot more expensive to produce and bring to market than class 1 or class 2 medical devices. Now the FDA only grants full approval for class 3 devices, which again tend to fall into the high risk, high reward category. So it makes sense that they would be subject to additional scrutiny and higher standards of regulation than a tongue depressor or a latex medical glove. But these devices also bear an improved seal of reliability after going through that regulatory ringer. Class 1 and 2 medical devices cannot be approved. They are only ever cleared. They are granted clearance to be sold in the U.S. market. And these are important details to know because of a recently released, very popular consumer device that, because of the sensors and software it contains, and because of what it purports to be capable of doing, had to be submitted for Class II FDA clearance and received it in record time, what some commentators see as being, let's say, conveniently fast. The article I'd like to start with today comes from Wired Magazine, and it's entitled, Apple Watch 4 adds ECG, EKG, and more heart monitoring capabilities. Honestly, there were about a million articles I could have used as the starting point for this conversation. The tech world has been abuzz about the new Apple Watch Series 4 and the new health-related tools that they've built into it. And that, despite the fact that arguably the most impressive and interesting of these tools aren't even available yet, as of the day I'm recording this, nearly a month after the watch was announced. Part of what's so remarkable about this release, though, is what it seems to indicate about the relationship between Apple and the FDA. Typically, the process of getting a new medical device on the market, especially if it's a Class II device or higher, can be tedious and time-consuming. Apple got two Class II medical device clearances for their ECG, which I'll get into in a second, and the watch's ability to passively monitor your heartbeat for irregularities, any strange rhythms, very high or low heart rate, things like that. It can then notify you, the wearer of said watch, that something might be up. As for the ECG, which stands for electrocardiogram, this is a novelty for the brand new Series 4 watch. The aforementioned heartbeat tracker thing can work for older models as well. It's a software feature that uses the same sensors that the watch has had in the past, but the ECG only works with the new hardware, and it allows you to put your finger on the little watch crown, that spinny dial on the side, and you hold your finger there while the electrodes touching your fingertip and your wrist measure minuscule electrical charges on the skin that are caused by the heart's pulsations. After about 30 seconds, the ECG can tell you if you are suffering from AFib, or atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat that can result in blood clots, stroke, heart failure, and other complications, none of them pleasant and many of them potentially fatal. The consumer-level hubbub over these developments have largely centered on the perceived increased healthy living value that they provide to wearers. More tools is better. More accurate tools is better. Novel tools that were previously unavailable in consumer-grade devices, that's better too, right? But in the world of medical devices, the focus has been 
on the change in posture by the FDA toward the consumer electronics industry. They rushed Apple's certification through their process using a recently updated de novo designation, which means that the device being appraised is new in some way and would usually be, by default, as a consequence of that, slapped with a class 3 label and all of the additional paperwork and footwork that that entails. But the de novo classification allows them to basically call that class 3 classification into question, which results in the forces that be at the FDA assessing the device and giving it another classification based on its actual merits and risks rather than the novelty. So de novo devices could receive a class 3, even after getting that additional attention from the regulators. But in many cases, this is applied because the device in question is not super harmful to users if something goes wrong. And that seems to be what's happened with the new Apple Watch capabilities, which were downgraded to class 2 devices, despite being substantially different from other currently available offerings. The most recent revamp to the de novo option came in 2017 as part of a purported change in posture by the FDA, which may indicate a burgeoning favor for consumer electronics companies trying to bring health-related technologies to market. Apple seems to have worked more or less hand-in-hand with the FDA to get these devices on shelves. They got their clearance in something like 30 days rather than the usual 100 plus, and that approval landed exactly on the day before their announcement of these new features, which tied in perfectly with Apple's marketing machine. That sort of regulator regulate camaraderie is unusual and a big deal. And this happens alongside a new pre-certification pilot program that the FDA is building in partnership with nine technology companies, including Apple, that will establish a system through which software as a medical device technologies can come to market more quickly and through which they can iterate more rapidly once they're on the market. What that means in practice is that a company like Apple could produce a piece of hardware like a smartwatch, with a bunch of sensors and other hardware built into it. That hardware, plus the operating system and connectivity between the device and other devices, would all be run through a hardware pre-certification process to make sure that it is a known entity, to make sure that it is understood very well. From there, these companies and outside entities like app developers could produce software that runs on these devices and get them out the door much faster than would otherwise be possible because they would all be using that same hardware, that same operating system, the stuff that's already been checked out, whose threats and risks and opportunities are fairly well known. At the moment, such software would need to be checked out by the FDA using mechanisms similar to those for tongue depressors or powered wheelchairs. Using this new model, though, we may be able to get more helpful, medically sound software out the door faster, allowing them to iterate and upgrade in public as a result of actual real-world use. We spend a good amount of time assessing the platform for that software, and then assume perhaps rightly, perhaps not, that anything built atop it will be, at the bare minimum, not harmful because we already understand the hardware that it's based on. The potential benefits in such a setup for these companies and developers are huge, as it would allow entities operating in the United States to essentially do the latter portion of their usual product development cycle with a huge real-world audience as test subjects, people who buy the app. Similarly, those subjects, folks using this software early on, would know that that device will work pretty well, and at the minimum, the hardware in which those apps are installed would work splendidly, even if the apps are a little bit glitchy at first. And they would know that that software on those devices would probably iterate and improve fairly quickly after it lands in consumer devices, at least compared to competitors' apps, because they wouldn't have access to that same collection of data from actual users. The downside, of course, is the potential that some of these apps, this software, could be relied upon too heavily, too quickly. Someone with heart issues could feel something wrong in their chest, but check their Apple Watch and have it tell them that everything's normal, nothing to worry about. And then that person might not act upon that instinct that something's up and call for help. 
The flip side of that, of course, is that we could come to worry over software-perceived symptoms too actively, which could lead to an overabundance of false positives and health-related concerns that are not actually concerns. I talked about hypochondria in the intro because the light, watered-down version of that condition is something that health officials have been worried about ever since fitness trackers and smartwatches originally hit shelves. The heart rate trackers and other health-related information in these devices have always been, and remain today, inferior in quality and accuracy to those that are found in hospitals and doctor's offices and other controlled environments. And as a consequence, there has been an uptick in worried patients stressing out and using up finite medical resources because their fitness tracker told them something disconcerting, or their smartwatch detected some condition or a hint of some condition that ended up not being real. The downside to increased abundance of data is that we individual humans are seldom capable of filtering it optimally. Most of us are not medical experts. And a lot of the information available to casual online browsers about the most common potential symptoms are utter nonsense. The ignorant leading the ignorant. This is a similar issue to that found in the broader online world, where more people have access to more information than ever before. But because we are not great, on average, at figuring out which of those data points are accurate, and which are fake, or trying to manipulate us, and which are the consequence of another ignorant person confidently sharing their uninformed opinion, we can sometimes end up less informed as a result of that data deluge rather than more informed. Journalists and scientists and other purveyors of truth struggle to find solutions to this new reality, and folks working in healthcare are finding themselves having to do the same. And that's been the case for bad online info and harmful folk remedies for a long time, but it's increasingly been an issue with imperfect data collected by well-meaning consumer-grade devices that users incorrectly assume are more accurate than they are. Now, all of that said, I personally tend to think of these sorts of evolutions in the regulatory world as promising developments. We vitally need regulation in these spaces, because the world is filled with unscrupulous snake oil salesmen and woo-peddling entrepreneurs who simply don't know any better. But we also want to encourage increased access to information that could help us make better choices as individuals. And technology and systems of that kind do not emerge fully grown out of thin air. They have to evolve. I would argue that history has shown that these sorts of things are more likely to evolve from a well-funded industry like that of consumer electronics than the bureaucracy-heavy B2B world of straight-up medical devices, a world that sells typically to just a few dozen rich healthcare entities and as a consequence evolves far more slowly and is more resistant to change. In some cases, a sort of plodding pace is actually baked into their business model because they don't have any good reason to make new investments when there's no one pushing them to. For all the flaws in the world of consumer goods, and there are countless such flaws, the scale of exposure of consumer-level products also means that there's increased scrutiny from multiple different angles and often more meaningful consequences for bad actors. As I said, it's nowhere near perfect, but in comparison, I suspect that we will see more substantial and rapid upgrades in this space when the device selling reins are in the hands of companies like Apple, Fitbit, and Samsung, all of which are partners in that pre-certification pilot program that I mentioned. There's just a crazy amount of potential in this space, and part of that potential stems from that scale which is already being leveraged by some of these tech companies. Part of the data Apple submitted to get their new heart tracking software cleared by the FDA was collected as part of a heart study conducted in partnership with Stanford Medicine, which took place over the course of about 15 months and which invited anyone who had an Apple Watch with the appropriate sensors to download an app and submit their data to help optimize Apple's heart tracking and AFib detecting software. 
Participants who showed indications of possible heart issues were connected with heart doctors and in some cases issued e-patches, which were adhered to the skin and allowed for more accurate heart readings. These patches and consultations were provided free of charge, all of it sponsored by Apple, and this gave them tons of data that they could then submit alongside their clearance-seeking paperwork to the FDA. Apple sells around 15 million Apple Watches a year. And that doesn't include the active second-hand market that keeps these things alive after the first user moves on to another brand or an updated Apple Watch of some kind. That's a lot of potential data points for a company that has this sort of reach. And as with so many things, the network effect, the massive scale at which they operate, allows Apple and similar companies, but Apple in particular in this space, to do things that no other company could manage, even if they wanted to. And this investment could prove incredibly lucrative for Apple, especially in the United States. Consider what happens if and when insurance companies begin to use these data points provided by this reputable source, this watch software with FDA clearance, to screen their users. This has long been a fear of health world prognosticators as insurance companies tend to use data to screen out quote-unquote undesirables, those that will be more likely to cost them money than to make them money. And that is absolutely a huge concern here, no doubt about it. But the flip side of that worry is those who are willing to use such fitness trackers and to wear those sorts of sensors may get discounts on their insurance plans. If Apple and other consumer-grade health hardware and software makers can demonstrate that folks who wear these devices are healthier and less likely to suffer catastrophic and expensive injuries, the insurance companies may run the numbers and decide, okay, yeah, it's in our best financial interest to get more of these things on our customers' wrists. Many insurance companies are already providing deals or subsidies if their users buy a step tracker or similar piece of hardware. Research has shown that these things can actually cause people to make healthier decisions, not necessarily because the tracking itself is super accurate or helpful unto itself, but because wearing this type of device can change a person's self-perception, causing them to eat better, to take the stairs instead of the elevator, things like that. One potential next step in that process can already be seen in some parts of the insurance world. The insurance company John Hancock, for instance, made some waves when it appeared to announce that all of their customers would be required from that day forward to wear a health tracking device and to submit their data to the company. Later clarifications to that initial Reuters story that broke the news indicated that actually they would be making these devices a free Fitbit or a cheap Apple Watch available to all of their customers along with supplementary preventative healthcare services and information. And their customers could then choose to add on an additional service for about $2 a month that would allow them to submit their data from these devices to the company and receive up to 15% off of their premiums based on what that data says. So if they're leading active lifestyles that would seem to be heading toward positive health outcomes, then they would get a decrease in the cost of their insurance premium, which again could proved to be a substantial discount for healthy or aspirationally healthy folks who are on these types of plans, while hopefully not penalizing those who are less so. That said, insurance companies are allowed to raise rates on folks who smoke or who drink to excess because the research is very clear that both activities, along with a slew of other demonstrably dangerous life choices, substantially increase a person's chances of falling gravely ill or succumbing to injury, which in turn increases the company's risk of having to pay out a lot of money for their hospital bills. So it looks like there will be a good deal of towing the legal line here for insurance companies in the coming years. There's a lot of potential benefit to these devices in the data that they collect. And ideally, we use that data to make better choices for ourselves and to be more informed about our health rather than leaving all of that information and the responsibility for that type of information to other people, to professionals. 
but there's also a chance that we could unintentionally step over into dystopia territory, giving all of our data to these big faceless corporations to use however they please, including to segregate us based on circumstances that led to particular health outcomes none of which we have much control over, or in some cases, which we could potentially change, but for many good reasons do not. Or perhaps we just can't as readily change as someone else might be able to. It's one thing to provide monetary rewards for certain behaviors, and another entirely, according to the U.S. legal system at least, to penalize someone for other behaviors. The line between these two things may blur, though, as we all come to know more about our health issues and can more easily differentiate between groups who suffer or don't suffer from particular illnesses or conditions or habits. I'm guessing in the interim, though, we will see some abuses of this new data alongside some potentially very beneficial changes. There's a lot to look forward to in this industry, based on patents that have been submitted and some of the rumblings that have been percolating up through the rumor mill of late. Apple would seem to be working on software to test for Parkinson's and to assist both Parkinson's patients and those who are at risk for Parkinson's. They're involved in a bunch of research about sleep tracking and things like sleep apnea, and they're apparently trying to figure out how to measure oxygen levels in the blood of people wearing their watches using pulse oximetry, which could allow our smartwatches to detect issues like hyperventilation, low blood cell counts after medical procedures, and even issues with pressurization when we're traveling in a plane. Apple has two patents related to blood pressure detection, and their method for making this work in a watch may involve holding the watch against your chest, which would look a little strange, potentially, but a lot less strange than wearing today's blood pressure monitors out in public. There are reports that they may have a UVIR spectrometer, that's ultraviolet infrared spectrometer, in the works, which could serve as a kind of sunscreen detector, showing you where on your skin you are susceptible to getting burned or getting skin cancer before you go out into the world unprotected and uncovered. This is especially important for folks that live near the equator. There may also be some kind of non-invasive glucose monitoring solution on the horizon. This would be a remarkable tool for folks who have diabetes or pre-diabetes, as it would allow them to keep tabs on their glucose levels without having to prick their skin all the time. This sort of tool is kind of considered to be the holy grail in the world of medical tech. And many other companies, including Google, which has purportedly been working on a tech-embedded contact lens for the same purpose, are trying their hand at it. So it'll be interesting to see if something like that actually emerges. Speaking of which, as I mentioned, Apple is not anywhere near the only consumer technology company trying to enter this space and scaring the bejesus out of traditional medical device players as they enter that much smaller industry and stomp around. On the day the well-known speaker company, Bose, announced they'd be entering the hearing aid market, for instance, the stocks of three of the world's most prominent hearing aid companies dropped by 10 to 13 percent apiece. I would not be at all surprised to see other companies, especially those with deep tech world roots, like Microsoft and Amazon, take a look at the numbers in the medical industry and decide sometime in the near future that they want a piece of that too. Many of these companies have similar asymmetrical advantages to those that Apple brings to the table, and even if their offerings look different, they might not be glossy smartwatches, it could be that they step in and begin to dominate some other portion of this sector that is currently owned by a health world-specific entity. Now that potential is neither 100% negative or positive. There are plenty of good arguments to be made in both directions for this shift in the medical device world that's going on as we speak, but it is a good trend to recognize because it could have ramifications far beyond the world of consumer electronics and stock market numbers. This could influence the way that we define ourselves and the way that we are defined by the organizations and companies that decide what we pay for things and what our expenses look like each year. It could help us become healthier and help us avoid avoidable issues that might otherwise kill or severely injure us. It could allow us to take more control of our luck 
by helping us stack the deck for positive outcomes, because we can see what may happen and make adjustments to our lifestyles accordingly. But it could also put more of those tools in the pockets of big data manipulators, leaving us beholden to what they decide to tell us about us, while charging us for the right to be drained of data for their exclusive use. It could lead to more bias within structural systems. It could leave us with less control and useful info rather than more. Part of what determines those outcomes will be how these regulations, which are being written today, turn out. Another part will be how we potential consumers respond to these devices and their supplementary business models. And the rest will be determined by other occurrences in other seemingly unconnected industries. Raw lithium market fluctuations and social norms related to wristwear could come to at least partially determine how healthy we are capable of being, and what we learn as a species about the countless diseases and health conditions that plague us today. I am currently on tour, traveling around North America, giving talks in 20-some-odd cities and having a blast. If you'd like to come out and hear me speak live, if you'd like to get a hug or a handshake, if you'd like to get a book signed, pop on over to becomingtour.com and see if I'm coming to your neck of the woods and then pick up tickets if applicable. Another great way to help support my work is to pick up one of the books that I've written. You can find a list of those at colin.io, and you can purchase them wherever you get your books. The podcast that I'd like to recommend today is called Uncover, Escaping Nexium, and Nexium is spelled N-X-I-V-M. This is a podcast about a modern cult, and it's one that took in a whole lot of people in high society, some very wealthy and famous people. And it's also particularly interesting because of the spin that has been put on it. Like most cults, it was run by a charismatic leader who is now caught up in the justice system, but he had kind of a group within his group that purportedly was kind of a BDSM sex thing, and a lot of people who were in the main group did not realize that. And so as a consequence, this cult became known as a sex cult, which is interesting in a way because in a lot of ways, the bigger issue, I think, is that this company was a great big multi-level marketing scheme, which if you've heard me talk about this on the show before, is really just a pyramid scheme that was made legal because of a technicality. But regardless, the story of this is interesting. It follows a person who left Nexium, and she goes in depth about what happened within the group and within that secret group within a group. And it talks about some of the complications when you try to leave this kind of organization, the links that they will go to to try to destroy your image so that you cannot be taken seriously when you tell people what happens within the organization. So it's not always super easy listening. There's some pretty disturbing stuff that happened or purportedly happened within this group. But I think it's a good listen, particularly because it demonstrates just how easy it is for even very intelligent people to get pulled into these sorts of circumstances and to convince themselves, even if they see things that they know are wrong going on around them, that everything's okay. I think that's a super important message because it's easy to look at cults of all shapes and sizes and just think, wow, how could you be such an idiot to be conned by this sort of thing? But things look very different from the outside than they do from the inside, typically. And even people who know what to look for when it comes to cults can get pulled into cults, particularly if that cult has a veneer that particularly appeals to them and their personal ideology. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider subscribing to Uncover Escaping Nexium wherever you get your podcasts. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find out about the tour that I'm currently on at becomingtour.com, and feel free to reach out and say hello on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.